Well, thank you all for coming this morning. I think you're in for a treat. Sarah Lambert, um, whom I just gotten to know in the last uh, day, is a, a, a delightful guest and um, a very experienced explainer of European things. Uh, I think she has uh, been for the last four years in Madrid with the European Commission, uh, which, as you know, is the executive body of the European Union, and um, trying to explain EU policies in Madrid in the teeth of the economic crisis might be one of the toughest public affairs jobs going. Um, before that, she had an even harder job. She had to explain the European Union to people in the UK, where she was in charge of communications in the UK office for nearly a decade. She's worked in a number of areas in the Commission, including uh, in the single market. Before she joined the Commission, uh, Sarah Lambert was a journalist and worked for quite some time with the um, news agency Reuters, and then was one of the team of founders of a very lively um, paper in the UK called The Independent, which is, remains a going concern today. Uh, Sarah Lambert uh, has um, uh, uh, a, a wide range of experiences in different European Union organizations and institutions can answer questions on a, on, a, on a large number of things, but we've asked her today to begin her remarks by talking about democracy. And so she'll talk about democracy in the EU uh, with the four Ps that uh, Corey Leonard's already mentioned. I hope you'll join me in giving a warm welcome to Sarah Lambert. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Yes, I am a glutton for punishment, which is why I've fled here to the US. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor Jacobi in particular for inviting me here. This is my first visit to Utah. Uh, but most of all to you for turning up at 10 o'clock on a Friday morning, the morning before the Big Mac. So, you know, good for you. As you can say, I'm not a very formal person. Uh, a few caveats. First of all, uh, what I'm going to speak about is very close to my own heart, but they're my own views and not necessarily the views of the Commission. Uh, I very much like interactive debate, so I'm going to talk for as long as it takes me to say what I have to say. What I have to say isn't particularly a thesis. It's more a set of ideas, um, history, geography, provocation, uh, hopefully to stimulate you all to really hit me with it when I finally stop talking. And also, just to say that you should know I'm not an academic. I don't study politics, although I have. I do politics. So as uh, Professor Jacobi explained, my job at the moment is really to explain to uh, my employer in Brussels what it is in Spanish domestic politics that sometimes blocks Spain in the European context. And similarly, to talk to uh, my contacts in Madrid, government, stakeholders, all over the country, in fact, about what it is that Europe is trying to do in Spain. So that's my, a bit about my background. Uh, and I am indeed one of the 17,000 or so people from 28 different economic country, uh, European countries who works for the Commission which, as you know, is the EU executive. So essentially, we propose and draft EU legislation. Uh, what I want to talk about is what's happening in the capitals of Europe, about which I hope you have some ideas, and how that is actually impacting on the politics of the European Union. I think Europe is at some kind of tipping point. Discussion about the EU's so-called democratic deficit, that is, its apparent lack of political legitimacy, has been going on for a long time. But right now, as the EU recovers from the euro crisis and begins a new phase of economic integration with banking union, this issue of political accountability is causing urgent concern. Why should you care? You care. And I think that's for the obvious reasons. Um, you probably have term papers to write. But uh, in, <laughs> in geopolitical terms, the EU is an increasingly big player, most especially once the comprehensive free trade deal, which is now in negotiation with the US, is concluded. And I think also because the issue of democratic legitimacy is one for all mature governments. So it's not confined to the EU. It's a question, I think, that this country uh, is facing too, albeit though it's framed very differently. And it was very interesting for me to arrive in the US after we'd heard so much about how Europe was about to collapse, how inefficient it was, how its government model was broken, to witness government shutdown in the US. 
I just put that out there. I just put that out there. So uh, I'm also technologically challenged. So if this doesn't work, you'll have to bear with me. This is the EU as it currently exists. Though, of course, first mistake, spot the first mistake. Anybody? Right, there are now 28 member countries. Uh, and Croatia joined this summer. Croatia down there in the Balkans. Right. Uh, the EU, all 4 million square kilometers of it, is a uniquely exciting, flexible, and dynamic form of governance, and it has no parallel anywhere else in the world. It's not a federation of states. It's not exactly a confederation of states. What is it? This is the headquarters of where I work, the Commission. Uh, but the institutions all together that make up the EU, it's a supranational, quasi-international organization with a transnational parliament directly elected by 500 million people. That's the world's largest, third largest population after China and India. And it's a supranational body that is actually run by 28 sovereign states. Well, sort of. Well, always if we're talking about foreign policy, uh, never if we're talking about competition policy, in certain circumstances if we're talking about homeland security. So you are probably confused, uh, which is how most EU citizens feel. It's very difficult to get to grips with and to understand why it's sometimes hard to forge consensus on the way forward. I think we have to go back to basics, so bear with me a bit. Why was the EU created in the first place? Well, obviously, it was born from the ashes of the Second World War, which is probably, if not certainly, the bloodiest conflict in terms of absolute loss of life in all of human history. Now, I imagine for you, as for most Europeans under the age of 50, the Second World War is a bit like talking about uh, Greek and Romans. The EU has guaranteed more than 50 years of peace in Europe, but that doesn't frankly seem overly important if you're young and unemployed. But it is crucial to an understanding of why the EU is as it is and where it's going. And if the EU is currently suffering something of a midlife crisis, I should just like to tell you, and I know that there is nothing wrong with midlife crises. <laughs> They're all about the reassessment of goals, the redefinition of method, and the realignment of resources for a more rewarding future. And the EU is currently doing all these things. And that is why it is such an exciting, flexible, and dynamic organization. This, sorry for the resolution. My next uh, learning is going to be on how to do knockout slides. However, this is Dresden after the Second World War. So back to the 1950s, contemplating a Europe literally raised to the ground, the founders of the EU had but one objective, to ensure it could never happen again, to contain Germany. And the German question is still central to European politics. What do you need to wage war? You need arms, arms made from iron and steel. So if you could pool iron and steel production, you would make it hard to go to war. And so, put horribly simplistically, it was. The Founding Fathers drafted rules to make this particular cooperation stick, but in the knowledge that that collaboration would have a certain amount of spillover into other areas, and that is how the EU has developed ever since, by adapting the rule book to circumstance. The early years of the EU development was about getting that basic rule book together, but by the 1970s, the project had kind of plateaued, and Europe, like everyone else, was hit by the oil crisis. So they came up with a plan Whoops. They came up with a plan to integrate more slow, closely the creation of a single European market based on the freedom of movement of goods, people, capital, and services. And when you trade across borders, you need common standards and a body to define those standards and to ensure that they're met. And so the EU enjoyed its second expansionary phase and grew to include more countries. And because the single market is only optimally effective with a single currency, so the EU moved to create one. And when the Berlin Wall came down and all those countries that had been satellites of the USSR wanted to return to their historic European roots, to a common culture and value system, and to share the EU's economic success, the EU enlarged to accommodate them. And there you have the various phases of enlargement. So the development of the EU might be seen as establishment, consolidation, expansion. And in a period of economic stability, all went wrong. Well, but then came the economic crisis. Now, Europe, as the IMF's Christian Lagarde noticed recently, tends to advance through crisis. It's in its DNA. Well, why? For me, it has to do with the creative tension between the different levels of government, between the supranational and the intergovernmental, 
And it tends to mean, in my view, that in normal circumstance, it takes some time to build the necessary consensus between very different member states. And look at Finland and Greece. And they're all in the same club. Only in extremists, arguably, can these processes be really short-circuited. And it is this, the EU's flexibility and adaptability, that makes the system work and the model special. It's a highly reactive model. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's fast, but it is very capable of adapting to circumstance. We are coming out of the crisis, and although growth will still be negative this year, in the third quarter it's slightly up, and uh, our own analyses show that economic activity will expand to 1.4% across the EU, 1.2% in the Eurozone next year. We're no means out of the woods, but we can see the path through, and the Euro's existential crisis is over. But for the first time since its creation, the European Union, all member states of the European Union virtually, are experiencing a long and profound economic recession. The economic cohesion that the Union has been slowly facilitating is eroding. And as economic disparity between the northern and southern member states grows, which strains the concept of solidarity that underpins the Union, it's perhaps not surprising that citizens are asking, what is it exactly that the EU does for me? Now, the road to uh, economic and monetary union was conceived as the logical development of the single market, and it was first mapped out in the Maastricht Treaty that, introduced in, that entered into force in 1993. Now, one of the great things about Europe is it's a complete alphabet soup. All you need to know is that treaties are normally named after the town in which they were signed, and that because it is a rules-based system, the development politically of the EU has been through the constant redrafting of those treaties. So here we are, 1993, in Maastricht, the Netherlands. Great treaty, big step towards closer integration, and most fundamentally, uh, the steps towards EMU. But then Denmark shocked everybody by voting against the treaty. Now, up until then, the process of European integration had gone largely unmarked and mostly uncontested. But the creation of a euro currency challenged concepts of national sovereignty, not just intellectually, but emotionally as well. Most especially in the UK, but not only in the UK. And I think that's very important. There tends to be a view that the UK is Europe's most awkward partner. Hmm, to discuss. It was Denmark, after all, that voted against with successive enlargements, it became clear that a rule book that worked for 15 couldn't accommodate 27. And so work began on drafting an EU constitution. But again, the enthusiasm of the politicians was not successfully communicated to citizens. The constitution was roundly rejected by France and the Netherlands, two founding members of the European project. Now, I can't really emphasize, I was there at the time, how shocking this was. Uh, it was profoundly disconcerting to the political elite. It was exactly, it was more or less as if you'd been disowned by your own children. And it cut very deep. What finally emerged, because they all went back to the drawing board, was a very different document, the Lisbon Treaty, signed in Lisbon, Portugal. But the damage to democratic legitimacy of the EU, I think, was already done. There we are. The new Lisbon Treaty required ratification by the individual EU member states, and this time, it was Ireland that said no. Why? Well, people said, among other things, that they had no idea what they were voting for. And revisions were made, and it was put successfully to a second referendum. And I describe all this at length because it goes to the heart of the problem. The debate over the Lisbon Treaty, the endless wrangling, the somewhat esoteric at times debates, uh, the explicit public rejection initially and subsequent representation, albeit redrafted, laid bare some of the fault lines. But now, paradoxically, I think that it's the, Euro the economic crisis and its aftermath that rather than provoking the shearing away of public opinion for the European project, as many fear, might yet, I think, prove the spur for closer integration and a dramatic shift in accountability. In essence, European citizens, when polled, have long complained that they don't know how the EU works, that its processes are not transparent, and that voices do not count. In the meantime, political science has questioned whether you can have a European demos where there's no European state. The codification of the concept and rights of European, citizen, of European citizenship, such as the introduction of a common passport, the little red passport, the EU flag, the anthem, anybody know that the EU has an anthem? 
that's um, Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Um, a motto, anybody know what the EU motto is? Unity and diversity. Have done little to forge a closer public engagement in the process of European integration. Why? Well, I don't know how much you know, and I'm certainly not going to go in great depth here to the actual sort of institutional setup, but the institutions are a very complex mix. They are both supranational and intergovernmental. So you have a European Council that is made up of ministers, heads of state from individual nation states. You have a commission, the everyday working executive, that is made up of appointed commissioners who nonetheless give up their national allegiance when they become commissioners. Then you have the parliament, which is directly elected by uh, the electorate of all the UE countries put together. So at every level, you have institutions that have a link both to nation state governments, but are also supranational. It means that decision-making process is sometimes very open and often very opaque. The 28 countries that belong to the EU and their representative politicians can be inspiringly visionary and also depressingly parochial. Academics have argued long as to whether it's too unique a construct to bear comparison with any other form of government or whether it's such a mishmash of a lot of systems of government that it can only be explained by comparisons to these. And then we have the European Parliament, all 766 members of them. It's kind of like the House of Representatives. They're co-legislators in almost all legislative fields, and they're elected on the basis of national party allegiance, only then when they're elected to the Parliament in Brussels to join a wider European grouping and voting on bloc. So what I'm trying to tell you is that essentially the Parliament does indeed vote along left-right lines. So a Christian Democrat will vote more likely with a Christian Democrat rather than a German with a German. So they're elected often on a national basis, but when they get to Brussels, they become supranational. Again, national, supranational. But the electors till, still tend to see European parliamentarians as national representatives, as I've said, and they elect them on the basis of national issues. They are second order elections. And because the power and work of the parliament isn't much understood, and because links between national parliaments and the European parliament are weak, uh, when I was working in Westminster, which is home to the UK parliament, often the MPs in the national parliament had never met the MEP who worked in their same constituency on issues of common interest. That's changing, but slowly. So European voters tend often to regard the elections as unimportant. Uh, they may use it as a tendency to send a message or to punish governments back home. Turnout is low and declining. And in 1979, the first year of direct elections, it was 62%. And in the last elections in 2009, it was 43%. So just to emphasize again, the EU is not a federal state. It only legislates in those areas where its 28 members agree they can achieve more acting collectively than individually. So trade policy or environmental policy are obvious examples. But many of the issues that worry voters, health, education, for example, are not EU competencies. And that goes for some of the big ticket items. Although the EU has an embryonic foreign policy and cooperates very successfully in peacekeeping activities across the world, it doesn't have men under arms and it doesn't have a specific defense budget. Public support for the process of European integration is currently very low. The economic crisis has put economic growth and job creation at the top of the political agenda everywhere. Unemployment is the number one concern of EU citizens. And in many places, the policies of fiscal consolidation, which were implemented to cut government spending and reduce the deficit, mean that things get worse before they get better. In Spain, for example, where I work, 56.1% of young people under 25 are out of work, 56.1%. In Greece, in Portugal, in Spain, citizens have taken to the streets in protest. The number of people now living below the poverty line is rising, and this in the world's biggest economy, the world's biggest market. And there are reports of rising suicide rates in Greece. There have been forced evictions in Spain, etc., etc. Hardship has politicized society across the EU, and the concept of European solidarity has been tested. 
The Pew Research Center this spring, this, uh, as I'm sure you know, is a nonpartisan organization based in Washington, published a poll entitled The New Sick Man of Europe, the European Union, showing deepening disillusionment with the union in, a major, in major member countries. Right? So you can see there how that's changed over time. It's particularly noticeable in countries like Spain, <laughs> France, and Italy. Um, the conclusion of this report was that the effort over the past half century to create a more united Europe is now the principal casualty of the Euro crisis. At national level, voters have taken to the streets in protest, not only against Europe and austerity, but against government cronyism and corruption. Radical protest movements have flourished some. These are the indignados of Spain. The uh, movement, like, like them, have no identifiable leadership or particularly articulated demands. Others are anti-immigrant with an increasingly anti-Islamic focus. Why? Because in my view, it's worryingly sort of seductive to try and hide racism as a defense of, of, the, of the domestic status quo. So uh, all the debates around whether or not you can wear a burqa, for example, I would put in that category. Uh, in Italy, for example, in their national elections in uh, 2010, a stand-up comedian, guess who he is, Pepe Grillo, uh, won on an anti-government platform with 25% of the vote with a party he'd formed a year previously on the back of a highly successful blog. In this month's elections in Austria, a new faction, the anti-Euro Freedom Party, was the third strongest. In France, the National Front, there uh, she is, under Marianne Le Pen, has buried its um, overt anti-Semitism, rebranded, and is polling strongly at local level, particularly among women. In the UK, the strength of grassroots support for the UK Independence Party drove the UK Prime Minister to agree that under certain conditions, there would be a referendum on EU membership. And though still not guaranteed and a long way off, polls suggest a majority of the British public, currently, if asked, would leave the union. But this all needs to be kept in perspective, Europe's politics are in general still not the politics of extremism, far from. European leaders have indeed paid dear. Most have been punished at the polls for their perceived role in failing to anticipate the crisis, for exacerbating it, or for the austerity measures that followed. But popular support for many of those fringe parties that blazed brightly a couple of years ago, the Danish People's Party, the True Finns, Get Wilders Party for Freedom in the Netherlands, have not been sustained in subsequent elections. Voters are increasingly astute, and particularly in coalition governments, often vote tactically. In Austria, for example, the strong showing of the Freedom Party was on some analyses less to do with the strength of the right than the relative weakness of the centre-left. And for those of you doing comparative politics, the failure of the centre-left to kind of capitalise on austerity and come up with a, an alternative narrative for that is quite interesting intellectually. The economic crisis has politicised society across the EU, but in a strange twist, in so doing, it has provided European democracy with something that it was long deemed deficient, an issue that is both a national and an European concern. Because the economic crisis has put economic growth and job creation at the topical, top of the political agenda everywhere. Here are the effects. Trust in institutions is on the slide, but... I think you have to look at trust in European institutions compared to trust in all government institutions, i.e. people don't trust government. In general, does the EU conjure up for you a very positive, fairly positive, neutral, fairly negative, or very negative image? Total negative is quite high. It's uh, improved since the bottom of the crisis, but it's still no way up where it was in 2006. Whoops. Would you say you're optimistic about the future? Not especially. And again, these are uh, the EU figures. If you disaggregate that across member states, you'll see very sharp differences there. Please tell me to what extent you agree that my voice counts. A majority don't think their voice counts. Do you think the crisis has worked its peak? Over half poll think not yet, 
And yet, and yet, as a consequence, EU will have to work more closely together. The EU does have the power. It, it will be stronger in the long run. But do you feel closer to uh, people in other countries? No. So it's quite interesting to take all those together because people don't think the crisis has finished. They're pessimistic about most things, but they do believe that Europe is kind of doing the right things, although they don't have a voice in it, i.e. Europe is kind of happening politically without its, um, its, its policy. Now, I suggested earlier that the EU has developed in three broad phases, creation, consolidation, expansion. Perversely, perhaps, the economic crisis has given rise to a fourth, integration. All politics are, they say, local, and that has been a problem in Europe to somehow make Europe fully relevant to national politics. But the process of economic recovery seems to have precipitated a supranational debate about the speed and direction of closer European integration. The inability of EU member states to anticipate and prevent the crash, or more reasonably, to manage better the sovereign debt crisis, exposed the essential problems of economic and monetary union. It's monetary, there is a euro, but it's not economic. And so the solution lies in deepening economic integration. This process is already underway and has resulted in the immediate future in the first steps towards the creation of a full banking union and a range of mechanisms giving the European Commission in the European interest, reinforced powers of oversight, such as the right to comment on national budget, sometimes before they've gone to national parliaments, and to lock national economic ministries into a system of peer review designed to ensure that not only are the rules of good economic governance met, the debt and deficit criteria, but the macro imbalances like the housing bubbles that sank Ireland and Spain are picked up before they can do damage. The speed with which these changes have been driven through is quite staggering, which is why I come back to the theme that it's a very flexible government model. If you, were a, if you are indeed a close observer of European legislation, to have got this much through in the very short time is, as I say, almost historic. But the institutions are now knocking up against the very limits of their power as currently defined, and after the Lisbon Treaty, and again, this is a rules-based system, where uh, serious changes in the balance of power have to be uh, reflected in a new treaty. And after Lisbon, there is no appetite to negotiate yet another treaty change in the short term. In May next year, Europe, and that's another problem in discussing the EU, Europe, of course, might include Switzerland, not an EU member. It might include Norway, not an EU member. It might include Russia, not an EU member. It might include Turkey, not an EU member. And it tends to be used interchangeably, so often people don't actually know what Europe is. In this case, I'm talking obviously about the 28-member European Union, and in May next year, Europe will hold elections to the European Parliament. The campaign is already launched, Act, React, Impact, and it's to try and raise awareness and get the vote out. The concern is that a disillusioned public won't bother to go to the polls. Low turnout magnifies the impact of radical parties, since their activists, activists are more likely to vote. And if you add to this mix those who are protest voting, there is a fear that the election will deliver a factionalized parliament. Now, I don't want to go too much into the details, because I think it slows it down if you do a lot of institutional architecture. So I don't have a slide. But essentially, there are two big blocks, Christian Democrats and Socialists and uh, other, and a liberal bloc, and then the Greens are quite big, et cetera, et cetera. But if you started to see serious fractionalization, the risk is that instead of those very sort of cohesive blocs that tend, as I say, to vote ac across left, broadly speaking, left, right lines, although European politics isn't that quite that ideological, you might just end up with a load of sort of splinter and, and protest factions. I don't know if this will happen. We can discuss the likelihood. But I do know that nobody ever thought the EU could cope with enlargement from 15 to 25. It profoundly changed the EU, but it didn't derail it. The euro is still here. Greece is still an EU member. Last week, the EU signed a trade deal with Canada, and the TTIP negotiations are going well. And so, again and again, the EU has proved a resilient and adaptable model. The old view of democratic deficit tends to look at old views of representational government. So uh, politics, elections, etc. cetera. 
But maybe we're actually in a changing environment. And I'm just going to throw this thought out, and I'd be interested to hear what, what you think about it. Uh, the press today is full of the NSA res revelations, Merkel's phone tap, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and whatever you feel about state secrecy, it's interesting that that came out through the internet. And I think that the social media is having a huge impact on democratic accountability, not just in Europe, where the European Commission has now put a lot of resources into developing that, but also in America. The, um, the whole example of open government has been looked at very closely and is being very widely copied. It changes the way you engage with politics. Maybe you don't even vote anymore. Maybe you don't join a party. But maybe you're very active with Greenpeace. So maybe you're getting sort of single issue politics. And I think this is very, very interesting for something like Europe, because in a sense, it would give better representation to a very wide range of views. We are beginning to make steps in that direction. We have a large program of participatory democracy meetings. We're holding sort of town hall meetings across Europe to try and find out what EU citizens would like to see change, to explain better what it is that their EU um, government is doing. Uh, but also, uh, we have a series of citizens' initiatives, which is a little bit like what you have here in the States, where a group of citizens, if they get a, um, you know, the criteria quite tight, but if they can get enough um, people to muster behind a proposal, they can ask the Commission to look at that. And I leave you with just one little case study that I think maybe is pointing something to the future. I don't know if you've heard of SOPA and ACTA. ACTA is the uh, anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. And this was something uh, that the US and Japan and Canada came up with in sort of 2008-ish to look at the whole issue of um, illegal downloads of the internet, copyright, et cetera, et cetera, the whole issue of um, piracy. And the negotiating documents were not particularly widely posted, and the negotiations, as all negotiations of this type, happen between negotiators in, in small rooms, in dark places. And people began to get wind of this and complain that this process was not transparent, that it needed to be more open. The European Parliament took up the cause and demanded that the documents were made, um, made public. Those leaks all came through the internet, and through the internet grew this huge protest movement. There were protests all over Europe against this because there were sort of the, there's the sort of freedom of information, freedom of access to the net groups. There were issues about medicines and the third world. It brought together a lot of disparate um, uh, stakeholders. And eventually the European Parliament, which had to uh, ratify all this, refused to do so. The rapporteur who was on the case actually resigned. And the Commission, responding to this process, actually gave it up in the sense that we still believe that we do need data protection. There is a Data Protection Act going through at the moment. Uh, it's hotly contested between the 28 member states. Uh, and if anything, I think the events of these few, few days makes that uh, even more important. Uh, <coughs> it will be an element in the trade negotiations. But the way it is handled the transparency with which it is discussed will be very, very different. So I just put it to you that democratic deficit, think about it. Maybe uh, all that we are seeing is a change in the way that people engage with government. I very much hope so anyway. Uh, I'm going to stop now. I would very much like to hear your comments. If you think I'm off my trolley, that's a good American expression. Please say so. Uh, I'm very interested to hear what you think. I am researching here in the States participatory democracy and democratic engagement. And you are all young, uh, young Americans in one of the world's most vibrant, the world's most vibrant democracy. So please hit me with it. Thank you very much. Just one last thing. Since it's being recorded, Great practice for public speaking. Can you come up to the mic to make your question? And also, please, you know, I suspect I may never come back to Utah. So any question you want on anything, I will try and answer. Go. Go.
Shock horror. It's good for you. Um, I'm actually really interested in this ACT REACT IMPACT campaign. I've just been researching it recently. And I know you mentioned that uh, solidarity would come from economic integration. I've also seen that this, this sense of this campaign is that solidarity can also come through this campaign in social media. I wanted to know a little bit more about your views and your opinions on that. Do you feel like it's a little superfluous to claim that social media can have such a great impact, or do you believe that it might have that potential? Good question. I don't know. I'm also possibly the wrong generation to ask. Look at the slides. Uh, my sense, and I have two teenage children, so this is all very anecdotal, is yes. I have been quite dismayed uh, in that in my generation, you went out on the street. And we had lots of things to go out on the street about. And in a sense, it was like coming home to go back to Spain where they kind of bang pots and, you know. <laughs> But there are many places where I think that isn't particularly in the political tradition, but it doesn't mean that people don't care. And I think that uh, you, uh, and certainly the people coming up behind you, it's, it's second nature. And if you, were going to, if you were going to engage, how would you do that? And I think actually it's great for democracy because it means that there is a very, very informed, dedicated, group of players out there. It's fascinating for anyone who's interested in communications because governments, fairly obviously, quite like to control communication. They like to control messages. Control's too strong. They like to direct messages. <laughs> and that's right as well because otherwise it's all just white noise. So you need your government to kind of say, you know, amongst the thousand things happening, this is our priority. So I approve of that. I mean, that's what public affairs communication is about. But in this world, it's very, very difficult. So sure. it goes out much deeper, and it becomes then a series of partnerships and conversations. And I think that's very interesting for policy making. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, but I do think it's a great thing to be researching. It helps, thank you. <laughs> my name's Dallin McKinnon. I'm studying international relations. And my question deals mostly with the economic crisis. Um, and one of the main arguments I've heard about the European Union and the problems that it's had is the fact that those in the Eurozone have, they still have their fiscal policy, but in terms of monetary policy, their hands are kind of tied uh, with the Euro. So I'm wondering, I mean, you mentioned that economic integration is probably the answer. I'm wondering if you could go a little bit more into that and how that would solve the problem I just described. Okay, very, very basically, because I'm not an economist and it's quite a complex area. Um, the problem has been that we do indeed have the monetary union, but there isn't a system of fiscal transfers. So when you get into trouble, there isn't an automatic balancer. And that is what needs to change. And the process of economic governance that we've put in place should help do that. A banking union will help because one of the issues has been bailing out banks. And so that was why that is the first step But beyond that. You need mechanisms to ensure that there's a backstop. You need how is that going to be governed, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that is why we say that, in fact, it's not that this idea is suddenly new. It is that in good times, the, um, the weakness of having a monetary union without an economic union wasn't fully felt. Now that we have seen that problem, what we need to do is take that union to its full conclusion. And that, of course, is then linked up with the single market because that enables then perhaps us to finish the last pieces of the puzzle in the single market. We don't have a complete uh, digital market, for example, in tender comms, nor in electricity, nor in um, some services. So that's also something that we have to... Great. Thanks. My name's Taylor Elwood. I'm an international relations major. Um, so in your, in your presentation, you mentioned that the EU was formed to, to solve the German problem. Um, and my question is, with the economic crisis, it seems like Germany is getting more power, or, there, or people are turning to Germany to kind of solve their problems. So, so how do you go to Spain, um, or the Spanish diplomats, and say, you know, Germany isn't, isn't consolidating power and isn't an issue? First of all, I wouldn't like to say there was a German problem. Problem. There is a German issue, and I mean, that's obvious from, from history. Uh, Germany has been through the ringer uh, and has been hugely brave. I was working in 
respond when Helmut Kohl, when the wall came down and East and West joined, and Helmut Kohl announced very quickly that they would exchange the Deutsche Mark one for one. When I filed that story to my newspaper where I was working then, the economics editor rang me up and said, you must have got this wrong. It's just impossible to link one to one. But they did. Uh, and to do that, the German people went through quite some hardship. So the German argument would be that they made those changes in advance, and they're now reaping the benefits. There is a problem, however, I think, with an export led growth, largely because not everybody can be in export, exporting countries. And there's a, there was a recent seminar at Brookings, which you might look at, which looks at you know, quite what countries like Spain would have to do to actually level that out. It's true and unfortunate, I think, that this has exacerbated national conflict. And it is also true that in Spain, this is put firmly at the door of Germany. But I think Germany is very little understood. They are locked most particularly uh, by the constitutional court, which has to rule on many things and on a, uh, so limits their freedom of movement. And so I think the other thing to look at is that, you know, Germany's wealth is partly based on wage restraints. So if you talk to a general, you know, your average German, they don't feel like they are the super rich of, of Europe. So I think there is also a, a um, you know, sort of an emotional thing. It's, it's difficult, but I think uh, Germany has moved hugely, and that's what I say about it being a, reflect, a, a reactive model. You know, there have been, now that the elections are over, I think you might see a slight softening of that line, but there's not so many places that they can go to change, so. Yeah. Thanks. My name's Ryan Blank. I'm a, a European uh, studies major yes. from California. <laughs> um, European studies. And I'm, I'm curious, I guess my question is twofold. Uh, how likely is it that the UK will withdraw from the EU, and what would the effect of that be? Okay. The effect would be cataclysmic. Okay. How likely is it? I don't know. Uh, there are various caveats. First of all, the Conservative government, which is in, uh, in a coalition anyway and is having some issue, issues domestically, uh, has to win the, win the election. If it wins in another coalition, the coalition will you know, bring its views to bear. Uh, and also, they are currently engaged in a whole process of review. And the British hope, I think, is that Europe will change to accommodate British objections, and then it will be fine. Uh, I think my own view is that they have to be careful with this. I think the UK has been a huge benefit to the EU. They, uh, you know, they're They've been big in, in forging the single market. They've been big in enlargement. They are, are good Europeans, and the people, the Brits like me, working in their institutions are, you know, a solid people. Uh, and Europe, Germany in particular, for example, will bend over backwards to keep the UK there. You know, they are one of the big uh, powers on, on the, in, in terms of international diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera, but not at any price. So I think the UK has to look very careful at what it is going to ask Europe to change. That said, the EU has already understood that it must change, and we're currently going through a so-called refit program, looking at all the legislation and, and trying to make sure that it's fit for purpose, consolidating it where necessary, junking it where we don't need it. Uh, and again, I'd just like to say that, that the UK isn't alone in that. I mean, there are many member states now who are sort of questioning, hmm, why do we do this and this? And that is, I think, part of the process. That shouldn't be seen as opposition. This is a new, vibrant, and always developing uh, government model. And I think it's quite right that member states question what it's doing. Thank you. Cataclysmic, simply because, you know, the US, all UK trade is, is essentially with the EU. Hi. Uh, my name is Richard Bruner, I'm a history major, and I had a question for you. All things considered, all of the economic and dip democratic issues that the European Union is experiencing, um, do you feel like the European Union can continue to expand? Well, with Moldova, Turkey, Bosnia and Herzegovina seeking membership, do you feel like it can continue to expand, or has the European Union kind of reached the point where it needs to consolidate and stop accepting new countries? Good question. I mean, I think... First of all, the, the process of expansion is quite a long one. There are, I think, 33 chapters. The condition, the primary conditions are that you can actually uh, have the rule of law, you have the democratic institutions, you have a market economy, and that you can actually uh, take on the not inconsiderable body of EU legislation. So I think uh, it's important that those, that process is held open. I think there's also a, a question for Europe about how it relates uh, 
to the countries, particularly on its eastern flank, which is why we have the, the new eastern neighbourhood process. So I think uh, you know, the treaty certainly doesn't put any limit to expansion. Whether the EU institutions could actually absorb that right now, I think not. But then again, I think it's in a much longer uh, time frame. But what is very important, and I think one of the huge successes of the EU as a model, is that, that the attraction of the single market, of freedom of movement, and of a rules-based system is hugely attractive. And so it's in our interest to continue talking to countries like Moldova, to look at uh, relations with countries like Ukraine, to, and to keep supporting that process, because arguably it is the uh, incentive of European membership that has pushed democratic change and, and institution building in many of those countries. Thank you. Uh, Corey Chipman, European Studies major. Yes, too. Um, <laughs> uh, more of a cultural question uh, along the same lines. Uh, with Turkey on the track to become a part of the EU culturally, how are they going to integrate in a society that is becoming more and more, um, more and more secular, but in that sense anti-religious, especially anti-Islamic? I know you spent a lot of time in Spain and in the UK where these are hot-button issues almost to the same extent as they are in France? Um, just some comments. I don't think I have a, an answer. I don't, anti-religious, not sure. I think what you, you know, I mean, what you see perhaps is at moments of economic difficulty, people become much more inward looking. And the whole immigration issue, you know, you see it in the States too, it's partly to do with resources, misunderstanding, lack of uh, communication. Uh, and one of the roles of the EU is to try and look at those kind of issues. Uh, another issue is economic, so we are hugely active in working with, for example, some of the states in, uh, in the Horn of Africa to try and, and stop immigration flow. Um, Islam is an interesting question. The EU does not proclaim itself to be Judeo-Christian particularly, but most of its member states are. But Turkey is a very interesting country uh, in the sense that it is secular, not religiously run. And also, interestingly now, it's playing a key role in some of the developments in the Middle East. So it's a strategic partner and arguably is indeed a European country. My own view is that it will be quite a lengthy negotiation. Uh, as you know, there's huge opposition in Germany and France, and all I would say is that before you expand the EU to include new members, it has to be uh, unanimously agreed. Thank but you. we're working on it. As the EU executive, we're working on it, and they're making good progress. I know we haven't got much time, but I'm Elizabeth Lockhart, and I'm an international relations major. And um, you've already sort of referenced this. You talked about um, the rise of rather more right, anti-immigrant, anti-EU parties. But then you mentioned that their popularity isn't as large as it was a few years ago. So if anti-EU sentiment in that form isn't the greatest threat to the EU, what do you consider the greatest threat to the EU? <laughs> I know that's a huge question, but just. Lack of nerve. It's very hard to be unpopular, polls, politicians. And it is true that the institutions of the EU are not traditionally, or, or there are gaps in traditional democracy. And I think the important thing is for people to hold their nerve. We are making changes. We are reviewing everything as we go. We are coming out of the crisis. We have a program to move forward. Uh, towards 2020 for inclusive, sustainable growth. And I think if we stick to that, uh, we will see the way forward. And a lot of these, pro as growth starts coming on, then some of these problems, some of these problems will fall away. So I think the real, um, the real threat at the moment is a lack of self-confidence. Thank you. Any more? Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, Professor Jacoby has my details. If I can help any of you in the future, uh, please do be in touch. It's part of our job in the EU to try and persuade people like you to come across, to see the model for yourself, to engage with it. So thank you.